My dear countrymen, an objection I hear has been made against my second letter, which I would willingly clear up before I proceed. There is, say these objectors, a material difference between the Stamp Act and the late Act for laying a duty on paper, etc., that justifies the conduct of those who oppose the former and yet are willing to submit to the latter. The duties imposed by the Stamp Act were internal taxes, but the present are external, and therefore the Parliament may have a right to impose them. To this I answer with a total denial of the power of Parliament to lay upon these colonies any tax whatever. This point being so important to this and to succeeding generations, I wish to be clearly understood. To the word tax, I annex that meaning which the Constitution and history of England require to be annexed to it, that is, that it is an imposition on the subject for the sole purpose of levying money. In the early ages of our monarchy, certain services were rendered to the crown for the general good. These were personal, but in process of time, such institutions being found inconvenient, gifts and grants of their own property were made by the people under the several names of aids, colleges, tasks, taxes, and subsidies, etc. These were made as may be collected even from the names for public service upon need and necessity. All these sums were levied upon the people by virtue of their voluntary gift. Their design was to support the national honor and interest. Some of those grants comprehended duties arising from trade, being imposts on merchandises. These Lord Chief Justice Coke classes under subsidies and parliamentary aids. They are also called customs. But whatever the name was, they were always considered as gifts of the people to the crown to be employed for public uses. Commerce was at a low ebb and surprising instances might be produced how little it was attended to for a succession of ages. The terms that had been mentioned and, among the rest, that of tax had obtained a national parliamentary meaning drawn from the principles of the Constitution long before any Englishman thought of imposition of duties for the regulation of trade. Whenever we speak of taxes among Englishmen, let us therefore speak of them with reference to the principles on which and the intentions with which they have been established. This will give certainty to our expression and safety to our conduct. But if, when we have in view the liberty of these colonies, we proceed in any other course, we pursue a Juno indeed, but shall only catch a cloud. In the national parliamentary sense insisted upon, the word tax was certainly understood by the Congress at New York, whose resolves may be said to form the American Bill of Rights. The third, fourth, fifth, and sixth resolves are thus expressed. Three, that it is inseparably essential to the freedom of a people and the undoubted right of Englishmen that no tax be imposed on them but with their own consent, given personally or by their representatives. Four, that the people of the colonies are not and from their local circumstances cannot be represented in the House of Commons in Great Britain. 5. That the only representatives of the people of the colonies are the persons chosen therein by themselves, and that no taxes ever have been or can be constitutionally imposed on them but by their respective legislatures. 6. 
that all supplies to the crown being free gifts of the people, it is unreasonable and inconsistent with the principles and spirit of the British Constitution for the people of Great Britain to grant to His Majesty the property of the colonies. There is no distinction made between internal and external taxes. It is evident from the short reasoning thrown into these resolves that every imposition to grant to His Majesty the property of the colonies was thought a tax, and that every such imposition, if laid any other way than with their consent given personally or by their representatives, was not only unreasonable and inconsistent with the principles and spirit of the British Constitution, but destructive to the freedom of a people. This language is clear and important. A tax means an imposition to raise money. Such persons, therefore, as speak of internal and external taxes, I pray may pardon me if I object to that expression as applied to the privileges and interests of these colonies. There may be internal and external impositions founded on different principles and having different tendencies, every tax being an imposition, though every imposition is not a tax. But all taxes are founded on the same principle and have the same tendency. External impositions for the regulation of our trade do not grant to His Majesty the property of the colonies. They only prevent the colonies acquiring property in things not necessary, in a manner judged to be injurious to the welfare of the whole empire. But the last statute respecting us grants to His Majesty the property of the colonies by laying duties on the manufactures of Great Britain which they must take and which she settled them on purpose that they should take. What tax can be more internal than this? Here is money drawn without their consent from a society who have constantly enjoyed a constitutional mode of raising all money among themselves. The payment of this tax they have no possible method of avoiding as they cannot do without the commodities on which it is laid and they cannot manufacture these commodities themselves. Besides, if this unhappy country should be so lucky as to elude this act by getting parchment enough in the place of paper or by reviving the ancient method of writing on wax and bark and by inventing something to serve instead of glass, her ingenuity would stand her in little stead for then the Parliament would have nothing to do but to prohibit such manufactures or to lay a tax on hats and woolen cloths which they have already prohibited the colonies from supplying each other with, or on instruments and tools of steel and iron which they have prohibited the provincials from manufacturing at all. And then what little gold and silver they have must be torn from their hands or they will not be able in a short time to get an axe for cutting their firewood or a plow for raising their food. In what respect, therefore, I beg leave to ask, is the late act preferable to the Stamp Act or more consistent with the liberties of the colonies? For my own part, I regard them both with equal apprehension and think they ought to be in the same manner opposed. Habemus quidum centus consultum, tanquum gladium in vagina repositum. We have a statute laid up for future use like a sword in the scabbard.